before I read the scripture, uh, we're going to start at Psalm 51. And in the reading, you will hear me say the word hyssop. Now, for those of you who are Bible scholars, you know all about it. But if you're like me, you think, what's the big deal about hyssop? Hyssop, excuse me, was the um, leaf and twig that they used to paint the door frames at the Passover so that the angel of death would leave them alone when they were escaping from the Egyptians. So when you hear hyssop, you will maybe have a more a deeper feeling of what David is saying. So Psalm 51, the first four verses, and then we'll skip to seven, and then 10 to 12. Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgression and my sin is ever before you. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Verse 7, purify me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. And then down to verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain me with a willing spirit. Powerful words. Luke chapter 9, we're going to start at the 28th verse. Some eight days after these sayings, he took Peter and John and James and went up to the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face became different and his clothing became white and gleaming. And behold, two men were talking with him, and they were Moses and Elijah, who, who, appearing in glory, were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions had been overcome with sleep, but when they were fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing beside him. And as they were leaving, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let's make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Not realizing what he was saying. While he was saying that, a cloud formed and began to overshadow them. And they were afraid as they entered the cloud. Then a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my son, my chosen one, listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and reported to no one in those days any of the things that they had seen. The word of the Lord. We're here now in our second last sermon in our alignment series already. And uh, so what I would like you to prepare for, not next Sunday, but the Sunday after, March the 8th, we're going to have what I'm going to call a celebration Sunday. And there'll be kind of a recap of the things that we've been studying in the book of James, some of the lessons that have come out and the things that have been significant. But I want to give opportunity for you as well. There's going to be a mic, an open opportunity for you to share 
about the things that the Lord has done in your life through this, this alignment series and the things that have been significant for you, lessons you've learned, or maybe just encouragement or something that you would like to share that's happened in these last six weeks. So if you just kind of keep in the back of your mind, uh, that'll be in two weeks from now. We'll call that our Celebration Sunday. I called them this morning's message, What is True Security? So I googled, um, I wanted to find out the best and most advanced security system in the world. And so I was googling it, and I was expecting to co- it to come up as something like it was defending the crown jewels in Britain, or maybe the gold reserves in Fort Knox in the States, or something like that. But you know, I couldn't even find it because there were so many entries on Google on the advances in home security systems that it was pages and pages down the road till I could even get to what I wanted to find, and I just gave up. But that tells you something, doesn't it? That there's a fixation on security, personal security, of being able to know that the things that are in my home, the things that are in my life, are taken care of and are secure. People are obsessed with it. The, the diction, dictionary definition for security is freedom from danger, anxiety, doubt, want, or financial cares, well-founded confidence, precautions taken to guard against crime or harm. And people will go to all kinds of great lengths to make themselves feel secure. Threats are all around us to our security. They can come from different sources, from our economy, from our personal health issues, from family relationships that we have, and sinister elements in our society. We're bombarded about our security from all kinds of different directions. But when it really comes to security, think about it, it's an issue of control. Our quest for security is trying to control the possible negative outcomes of our life. We're controlling, want to control circumstances. We're trying to control threats. And we do that through various means. Sometimes they're admirable ones, they're good ones, and sometimes not so admirable. They might be even mean, and they might be even brutal. People will do all sorts of things when they're up against the wall, especially when they see their survival is in threat. You've heard stories of people who've resorted to cannibalism or willing to kill someone in order to secure their own security. In the section that we're looking at in James, we have James outlining here for us some issues of security, things that people rely on so that they feel secure. And the two that he mentions here are time and money. Both are powerful assets. They both can also be debilitating crutches if we depend upon them as Christians in a, when we're supposed to be depending on God. So, but with so many of these kinds of resources, there's no evil really within themselves. They are a commodity. They are along, uh, money is a commodity, time's a commodity. They possess uh, influence and power, but they are amoral. They, they can be used for either good or bad. And that's why we try to use them to help us feel secure in our lives. But as we'll see here today, we can try to use both time and money as counterfeits for the true security that we have in God. So let me just read, first of all, the passage, um, chapter 4, verses 13 to 16. That is the section that talks about time. 4, 13 to 16. Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast and brag, all such boasting 
is evil. James wants us to see that there are limits to time. We all have the same amount of time in a day, 24 hours. Some of us wish we had more hours. Some of us wish we had less. But 24 hours a day. But our lifetime, the life that we live, there are limits to what we have available. We say things like, well, there's always tomorrow or next year. The famous last words of farmers, right? We talk about time healing wounds. We talk about how um, if we had enough time that the wrinkles that are in our life, those things that are, that, that are a difficulty, maybe time will help calm the storms in our life and in the relationships or, or fix the things that are, are kind of an upheaval at times. We say, just give it more time and it'll work out. And if we do have time, those kinds of things can. Time can help in those types of processes. But time can be stolen away. Time can come to a screeching halt. Those of you who have lost loved ones by an accident especially know what that feels like when the time that you had anticipated or you had expected comes to a screeching halt. And because of that, time isn't a good resource to depend on for secure things. Time is limited. We don't all have the same amount of that resource. Some of us have a short period of time. Some of us have longer periods of time. And James reminds us that time in that way is like a vapor. It can be here and it can be gone. And we need to remember that truth when we're thinking about the use of time. The scriptures have, uh, have it as a common theme of this idea of our life being like a vapor or being, being cut short or these things. Uh, here's a few verses. Psalm 39, 5. You have made my days a mere hand's breath. The span of my years is nothing before you. Each man's life is but a breath. You sweep men away in sleep of death. They are like the new grass of the morning. Though in the morning it springs up new, by evening it is dry and withered. And then 1 Peter for all men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall. So time is a powerful commodity and a resource, but is limited. And we can't depend upon it for a source of our security. James also goes on to talking about the use of money. Now I'll read chapter 5, verses 1 to 6. Now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming upon you. Your wealth has rotted, and the moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay to workmen who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fatted yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered innocent men who were not opposing, who, who were not opposing you. Sometimes we use money to buy security. Whether it's to buy a, a warning system or some procedures that will advance our own health or to buy the favor of people to salvage a relationship that we have. We all use or we are tempted to use money to purchase what we think will give us security, protection and safety from the things that might harm us. But like the people who are in this passage, sometimes it's like a drowning person who is thrashing about for anything that will be able to hang on to in desperation to not drown. They're reaching for things that will help secure their future. And sometimes they're unscrupulous ways, as is mentioned here. But you notice 
that the real reason why they're doing it is to hoard it. To hoard it so that they would be able to, to, to have for their future. If we're expecting money to give us security, lack of it, or if it's all of a sudden taken away, that would be the source of insecurity. If you're depending on it and it's gone, now all of a sudden you would feel insecure. And our perception of becoming would be that we would be vulnerable and in danger if it was taken away. So we could justify devious ways of trying to accumulate more to get it, to eliminate the risks that we're going through. And sometimes we would justify that. Sometimes we justify it, not in every realm of our life, but maybe just in our business dealings, not in our home and, and the church, but in our business dealings we would. And it doesn't have to be just things that are illegal or immoral. It can be even just distractions, things that we depend upon when we should be depending on God. And as I said earlier, money is an amoral resource. How money is, it, is used is where the problems can lie. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, it says this, But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmless desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It doesn't say, the root, doesn't say money is the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. I once heard that someone had talked to John B. Rockefeller, one of the founders of the, found, the famous Rockefeller Foundation, some of the richest people in the world, and asked him, how much money is enough? And his answer was, always a little more. And a person doesn't have to be a rich person to have that type of attitude. A person could just have this desire that they need more to feel secure. And that's where the problem can be. Money, as well as time, can be an unstable and unreliable source for security. But you'll notice that I skipped verse 17. Verse 17, I think, is the key to this passage. I'll read it for us. Where did it go here? Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. Now, I don't know about you, but I've looked at that verse from time to time and I lifted it right out of its context. I've lifted it out and used it for some other thing, but I didn't take it in the context of what he's talking about here. He's talking about how um, a person might have the knowledge or the resources to know how to live their life properly but doesn't take that advice and goes out on their own? How does knowing to do right and not doing it, sin, have to do anything with the use of time? Or how does that verse have anything to do with money? Could it be that an attitude that sees life as fleeting is the only really correct way to live? So then I thought about people. I thought about people who lived like that. And most of the people that I know who actually lived like that were people who knew they were going to die. People who already knew that their life was coming to an end. Maybe they had cancer or something like that, and they were thinking about their final days. And so in light of that, they really started to think about what's important. What is really the things in my life that count? What are the things in my life that I should really be putting as a, an anchor and a foundation in? They are the people who prioritize themselves correctly. I remember a man by the name of Ron in one of our previous churches 
who at about my age and whose family, his, his boys were the same age as our kids at the same time. Um, he and he was a, a nice guy, worked in the community. He was a truck driver. Uh, he had a good living. He and his family were, were doing well. But he was kind of a lukewarm Christian. He went to church. He lived a moral life. He accepted Christ as a savior, as the only means by which he would be able to be right and go to heaven. But his faith didn't really affect more than that until he got cancer. He was, first they took out one kidney, and then after they removed that and he went through chemo, it came back into his, back, into his backbone and his organs, and he died a few months later. But I remember one time he came to my office that was between the time when he had finished, his kidney was gone and his chemo had been had finished. He came to my office and he said, Pastor Tom, I'm thankful for cancer. And as I'm sure you would, you go, like, what? You're thankful for cancer? And he said, I'm thankful for cancer because it had not been for cancer my life would have continued on as it was, no changes, nothing would have changed, and I would have lived this mediocre Christian walk for who knows how long. But because of the cancer, I know now what's important to me. I know what's important to God, and I'm making the changes in my life. As the cancer progressed in Ron's family, um, there came a point where he was going to have to go for some hospice. And rather than doing that, they brought a hospital bed to his home. And they brought, because the hospital bed was so big and bulky and heavy, there wasn't any way to bring it to the, his normal bedroom, so they left it in the living room. And that's where Ron had his final days, among the family, in front of his kids, in front of his wife. Because, to him... That was one of the priorities that he saw. He wanted to make sure that in his final days, he was demonstrating to his family, which he hadn't been doing priorly, prior, prior to this, but demonstrate to his family his faith in God, his relationship with God, and his love for his family. When we stare death in the face, it has a way of stripping away all these non-essential things all the distractions and all the empty pursuits. For Ron, it, was it, it stripped away all these other things that he was depending upon, all the other things that he thought were important. And what really mattered to him were relationships with God and people and his family. Ron's life before cancer was kind of a sad commentary on what he saw as meaningful in life. Did he know better? Did he before cancer know to do right, but didn't do it? I don't know, never asked him. But when I saw the change, I realized he must have because he knew exactly what he needed to do. He knew exactly where to put his priorities. He knew exactly where to spend his remaining time. So, living the way that Ron did before cancer, was he sinning? According to the scripture, I think he was. When we know better, but rather choose to turn a blind eye to what we know in our hearts is a right perspective, right priorities in our life, and we choose rather not to do it, we're acting very much like Adam and Eve in the garden, aren't we? Hearing what we know, but thinking we know better. And living out of sync with what God has for us. Proverbs 16 verse 18 says, Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. And that's exactly what pride is, isn't it? Thinking we know better than God. So when I look at verse 17 here, I believe that it applies to both the people before and the people after in this section. And the reason why, you'll notice the opening verse in verse 13 and the opening verse in, in 5.1, they open the same way. It says, now listen, you, 
And then he explains the category. He's talking about these two and puts this verse right in the middle to help us to see that both of these categories need to understand something about their pursuit. So what is true security? It's something that cannot be taken away. Something that cannot be spent incorrectly. It's something that will always be available. Something that cannot be used up. Something that doesn't have an expiry date or a stale date. Something that has an unlimited source. And something that is not threatened, but is always safe. And really when it comes down to, it's our relationship with God, isn't it? God has this really neat sense of humor. This week, I was struggling with my own issues of security, and God called me to preach on it. That's just how God does that sometimes. But another part of it, the story is, though, that Connie was also wrestling with it this, this week. And so many of you know that she blogs. And her blog was on this whole issue of security. And I didn't know she was writing about that. And she didn't know I was preaching about it. But the two things mesh so completely well that I thought I'd have her read her blog today as a closing to, to describe the whole idea of what true security is like. I'm just going to read it so I don't get lost or sidetracked. One night, in the middle of a deep sleep, I was abruptly woken up with a word, avarice. I didn't even know what that word meant and had thought that maybe I should write it down, but I was too tired, so I opted to go back to sleep. A while later, the same word shook me awake. It took three times, three times of hearing that word, uh, before whatever were awakened with that same word and when i heard it the third time the lord actually spelled it out for me i heard him saying a v a r i c e and i'm thinking i better write that down <laughs> anyway i knew that uh, it was something important but i thought i'm going to look it up in the morning i still was really tired and i thought i'm not going to really catch on to what's going on so i'm just going to write it down and look it up in the morning and in the morning i go lord why did you wake me up with that word what is so important that you had to do it three times is it an exposition of my heart a warning or conviction that i have already got there so i looked up the dictionary in miriam webster it says avarice is excessive or unsatiable desire for wealth or gain, a greediness. Google Dictionary says extreme greed for wealth or material gain, and Cambridge Dictionary said an extremely strong wit wish to get or keep money or possessions. I thought I had wrestled through that lesson before, but it turns out that I'm doing a loser lap. A loser lap is our family's term for saying, you know, when you've missed the turn and you go, ah, it's okay, I'll just do a lap around the block. And we just call that a loser lap. So for me, I had missed the sign that said, trust God here. So I have to go around the block and repeat the same process. It's not that I'm pursuing an abundance of wealth or possessions. I'm not asking for much, really. But I've become rather preoccupied with the looming bills and that think they need to be paid every month as well as the ones that are above and beyond those things, like busted hot water tanks, vehicle breakdown, medical costs and stuff. Lately, my prayers are filled with, oh God, we need you to intervene and provide for us, as though security in this world is the biggest deal. Whatever happened to Jesus, you are all I need. What happened to my resolve to express gratitude for the myriad of blessings around me? Has my bold proclamation that God is worthy to be worshipped no matter what, become just a pithy saying. Matthew 6, 24 says, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Strong's Concordance says that the word mammon, um, it does mean wealth, but also along with wealth, it means avarice. That there is that word again. Many translations use the word money, 
But that seems kind of a shallow interpretation. When I saw that mammon was translate avarice, I was stopped in my tracks. Yep, definitely doing a few loser laps here. One cannot pursue both material security and security in your relationship with father together at the same time. One is grabbing control and the other is relinquishing control. One fills a person with angst, worry that I might lose it all, and the other is with rest. I'm in the Father's hands and he's got this. It is impossible to worship God while worrying about life and the challenges we are facing. In the last few weeks, I've often heard myself say, if only our house would sell, then the rest of the stuff would be manageable. Then just as quickly, I hear Holy Spirit whisper, if only you would keep your eyes on Jesus and worship him for who he is, then you could relax. Dad knows what you need and he's working on it. To help me refocus on my amazing father, I searched out some of the names he goes by in the Bible. And here are just a few of them from Bill Bright's book, uh, God, Knowing Him by His Names. Elohim, the strong, faithful, and only true God. El Elyon, the most high God. El Roy, the God who sees. El Shaddai, the almighty, all-sufficient God. Jehovah Jireh, I am the Lord who provides. Jehovah Rohi, I am the Lord your shepherd. Jehovah Rapha, I am the Lord who heals. Jehovah Sabaoth, I am the Lord of hosts. Jehovah Shalom, I am the Lord your peace. No one else, nothing else can satisfy or help or protect. As I read these names for God, and there are many, many more in the Bible, I see that God is more than capable of looking after me. His character, the essence of who he is, is worthy of my worship and worthy of my trust. How could I forget? How could I get so caught up in my desire to experience external security? Again, I'm not saying that external security is bad or that I have arrived and that I don't wish for some resolution to our ongoing stressors. I am saying I was putting too much emphasis on these things for my sense of well-being and security. Stuff can be lost, burnt, destroyed, and our health can fail. But God's love for me will never, ever fade or diminish. He will always be with me, no matter what. Philippians 4, 6-7 says, Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. I'll call the worship team up and come up at this time. As they're coming, I just want to ask a few questions. Where is your security? What are you trusting in? What is the supporting the weight of your life right now? This verse stuck out to me this week as I was um, bringing this sermon to a close. Proverbs 3, 25 and 26. You need not be afraid of sudden disaster or the destruction that comes upon the wicked, for the Lord is your security. He will keep your foot from being caught in a trap. Let's bow for a prayer. Lord, we're thankful that you are there for us and that as we depend upon you, you give us the rest that we need. You give us the sense of, of um, taking away the angst or the worry as we trust you and as we really lean into our relationship with you. You are worthy of our praise and as we praise you and as we honor you and as we worship you, then these issues of our, our security, the things that we depend upon, can fall by the wayside. So Lord, help us to fix our eyes on you. Not on the waves, as Peter did on the ocean, but on you. And how we can proceed in our life in, in a sense of security, knowing that you're in charge. Thank you for these truths in Jesus' name. Amen. Our benediction. Let your unfailing love surround us, Lord, for our hope is in you alone.